You could put um, fine particles, say sulfuric acid particles, sulfates, into the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, where they'd reflect away sunlight and cool the planet. Papers going back to the 70s that look at the radiative and ozone uh, ozone destroying properties of aluminum in the stratosphere, and those make you think it might be useful. Do this in just a jet in a very simple way. Make high quality alumina particles just by spraying aluminum vapor out, which oxidizes. It. So it's certainly in principle. And you could do that by either building new versions of these aircraft or even re engineering existing aircraft. So there's some ideas of that. So you go to an engineering firm and you want this done. They don't say this is hard or unusual. They say, okay, yes, we could do it. That means that implementation decisions will be risk to risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different than normal. So I've told you that it's cheap to deliver materials to the stratosphere, and I'm convinced that's true. I don't think that will change. But I think. This geoengineering idea in its simplest form is basically the following. You could put um, fine particles, say sulfuric acid particles, sulfates, into the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, where they'd reflect away sunlight and cool the planet. And I know for certain that that will work. Not that there aren't side effects. And there are some bad side effects, like it partially destroys the ozone layer, and I'll get to that in a minute. But it clearly cools down. And one other thing, it's fast. It's saying that you do some geoengineering for a little while to take the worst of the heat off. You could uh, create an ice age at a cost of 0.001% of GDP. You could uh, create an ice age at a cost of 0.001% of GDP. The one thing about this is it gives us extraordinary leverage. This, this improved science and engineering will, whether we like it or not, give us more and more leverage to affect the planet, to control the planet, to give us weather and climate control. Let me distinguish these two different uh, kinds of geoengineering as clearly as I can. So the first one is what we call solar radiation management. And that's the idea that you could put reflective, mostly reflective particles or other means to make the Earth whiter, effectively to increase the Earth's reflectivity, reducing the amount of, of, of heat that's absorbed by the sun, and therefore exerting some overall cooling tendency on the Earth. I think, the, though, the initial results of climate models indicate that reflection of sunlight away from the Earth can offset most climate change in most places most of the time. But it will damage some places. We've mostly thought about sulfur, and nevertheless, there might be some good reasons to think about alumina. It turns out, first of all, there's been a lot of work on the environmental consequences of alumina in the stratosphere. There's a bunch of papers going back to the 70s that look at the radiative and ozone uh, ozone-destroying properties of aluminum in the stratosphere, and those make you think it might be useful. Do this in just a jet in a very simple way. Make high-quality alumina particles just by spraying aluminum vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's you could put um, fine particles, say sulfuric acid particles, sulfates, into the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, where they'd reflect away sunlight and cool the planet. And I know for certain that that will work. Not that there aren't side effects, but I know for certain that it will work. And There will be monsoon failures during that period. There will be huge hurricanes. The global, global studies, studies indicate there will be some impact on precipitation patterns. It might involve large-scale regional agricultural disruption lasting a number of years. Potentially, two billion people could have their food disrupted by such intervention.
My personal opinion is that we have to keep geoengineering on the table. We have to look at it very carefully because we might get desperate enough to want to use it. The danger, of course, with geoengineering is the one I was referring to a moment ago. We don't understand the system well enough to predict its responses in detail. And that means there's always a danger if you try to engineer the system on a large scale that you will do something that has side effects that are worse than the dimension of the problem you're trying to cure. Uh, there are a variety of schemes that have been discussed for geoengineering. A classic example is uh, injecting reflecting particles into Earth orbit that would uh, deflect some of the sunlight that would otherwise be warming the Earth. No engineers are proposing spraying 10 to 20 million tons of toxic aluminum and other substances into our sky for the stated goal of cooling our planet. So let me distinguish these two different uh, kinds of geoengineering as clearly as I can. So the first one is we call solar radiation management. And that's the idea that you could put reflective, mostly reflective particles or other means to make the Earth whiter, effectively to increase the Earth's reflectivity, reducing the amount of, of, of heat that's absorbed by the sun, and therefore exerting some overall cooling tendency on the Earth. is that alumina has four times the volumetric rate of forcing it for small particles as does sulfur. And that means you have four times less surface area for the same rate of forcing. And this is a much bigger deal. You have roughly 16 times less the coagulation rate. And that's the thing that really drives removal. So you could get away, we think, with much smaller mass fluxes. So that's why we see things like in the uh, use, use aircraft patent from 89, they talk about aluminum. And that's why we're seeing in the surface water samples aluminum. And here's David Keith saying uh, that aluminum has four times the reflective uh, volume surface area. So they'd like us to think that we're talking about sulfur, but here they slipped up and let it out that uh, aluminum is four times better to achieving their ends, and it sounds like it's kind of the one they don't want us to know the effects of. Mm -hmm. The little picture is from a nanofabrication study, which shows you can make very high quality, and do this in just a jet in a very simple way, make high quality alumina particles just by spraying aluminum vapor out, which oxidizes. So it's certainly in principle possible to do that. There's a big literature that's already looked at that. And you could do that by either building new versions of these aircraft or even re-engineering existing aircraft. So there's some ideas of that. So you go to an engineering firm and you want this done. They don't say this is hard or unusual. They say, OK, yes, we could do it. Aerosol geoengineering looks like it is so cheap that the cost is basically not going to be an issue. That means that implementation decisions will be risk-to-risk -risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. And it makes the problem of how we govern it fundamentally harder and different and normal. So I've told you this cheap to deliver materials in stratosphere, and I'm convinced that's true. I don't think that will change. But I think the more we do research, the less easy this will look, the more complicated the environmental effects will look. And that's a good thing, because right now it looks too easy. So I think that if we do more research, we're likely to find out that it's harder and more complicated than we thought and that the side effects are harder to manage. And that's a healthy outcome that will make it easier to do the management. Of course, the opposite reaction is possible. It's an empirical question how people will actually react to knowledge about this. Another reaction is to say, if these crazy scientists are so concerned about putting CO2 in the atmosphere, they want to think about these things, then that might actually mean we should be more serious about the risks of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, numerous air quality studies, uh, including from uh, CARB, California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters? The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health if they came down into the stratosphere, in, uh, in, in particular uh, small particles and aluminum? So, so the, the collaborators in mind working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation in a level pencil and paper, but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you're just thinking about the sheer number of particles and the hu helmet, human health impact of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do uh, epidemiological research on human health impacts, and it's not even close to being an issue. 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere would have no human health impact. 
So, so let me be more careful here. We're to separate out the toxicological. So the Illumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing. Illumina, we've only begun to research and published nothing. Dane looked at him and he said, so you're telling me that spraying 10 to 20 megatons of aluminum, as you said, would have no human health effects? He took a deep breath and he swallowed and he said, let me be more careful here. We haven't done anything serious on alumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. It. And that, for me, that was the whole main point of, of what is, is going to be coming out to the public. It's, it's the damaging effects of aluminum that are being found around the world in massive amounts. Here's David Keith confronted on this very issue and he, he looked, you know, at that point like, like they just let the cat out of the bag. Mm -hmm. We haven't done anything serious on alumina and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked at. It. How can I look my children in the eyes? and not try to shed the light on this issue, knowing every breath they take is, is laden with these metals. I have been forced to conclude that there is no greater or no more immediate threat to anything that lives and breathes than the global geoengineering programs short of nuclear catastrophe. They're proceeding because they have an agenda that's separate from trying to thwart this crisis of global warming. You know, there's there's obviously several other objectives, whether it's depopulation, control, uh, weapons aspects, communications aspects, all kinds of things, you know, wild cards that we know nothing about. We don't really know, and I'm not going to attempt to speculate on exactly what the agendas are, but we can see clearly they're not, uh, they're not, the agendas are not benefiting mankind. You know, it's benefiting the agenda of the elite.